Hi. Um, we'd like to know how you first uh, got into television. Got into television? Well, that was through a trick, but I got into broadcasting through another trick, uh, which is, the, the whole thing is made up of tricks, that I went to see a very important man who now sadly is dead, a man called Stanley French, who was at one time the head of the BBC Drama Repertory Company, which was the sound, radio, acting repertory company. No, it's, it's now finished, but Stanley French was a big man, and I suddenly decided I had a, a, a hankering to go into broadcasting. So I went to a broadcasting house in London, uh, brazenly waltzed into Stanley French's office, and alleged that I had an appointment with Mr. Stanley French at three o'clock on a certain afternoon. I hadn't. The secretary looked in her book and said, no, you haven't got her. I said, well, I met the man on the train. He said, see me today at three o'clock. So after that, um, I said, well, sit down. Mrs. French is at lunch. So I waited, and after a while, a pinstripe gent went through into his inner office, and uh, I didn't acknowledge him. He didn't acknowledge me. And finally, she, the secretary, put the message through to Stanley French that uh, there was a drama at three o'clock. And uh, so, uh, after a while on the intercom, I said, "Never heard of it." Never heard of it. Went in and I said, "Open the door." And I saw this guy behind the desk. I said, "Oh, can I see Mr. Stanley French, please?" And I am Stanley. I'm awfully sorry. I, 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 I must have the wrong office because you're not Stanley French. I am Stanley French. To cut a long story short, uh, I had alleged that I'd met a Stanley, a man who said he was Stanley French on a train, and that could I see him at three o'clock. By that, I was talking very like that, you see, in terrible sort of BBC, trying to get into the BBC. And he said, You've got a good voice. Do you want to act on the radio? I said, Well, I'd like to. Uh, well, hang about for a moment. I've got something to see at three o'clock, who is quite genuine, if you'd like. <laughs> so I sat, and I got into radio that way. And then at the same time, I was a journalist, and I took a voice, as it were, like that, you see, and they would always talk like that at BBC, but in ITV you can talk a bit faster, and a bit sillier, they can get more, you know, have more gin. Um, so I took, went over to ITN as a sound commentator over films, because when ITN started, or just after it started, instead of the newscaster doing the voice over film inserts, they had an outside commentator, and I shared it with people like Roger Delgado, Valentine Dowell, and myself, Wensley Pithy, and myself were four commentators over film. So from there, obviously, I was casting out to find out what else I could do in television. And I, since then, I've been a producer, writer, and now quite comfortably announcer, because I can do other things as well at the same time. But how I got into it is a, is a very complicated story, and that's only the sort of a synopsis yes. mm -hmm. of two tricks. So you were reading in the paper the other day, in the Evening Post, um, when you... No, the, the marriage was... Uh, the marriage, up. yes. Yeah. Um, it said you were born in Liverpool. Were well, yes, I was born Heavily disguised Liverpudley. Ah, said. well, heaven, yes. <laughs> you, you, you do, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, well, you see, the Liverpudlian has a very great penchant for loving his town, and I do love it dearly, but at the same time he's got a hell of a bent to get out of it. Whether he talks in a Liverpool accent, which I still maintain, I still keep it, and in my wilder, happier, poetic moments, I lapse into scouse, because it is rather like somebody playing cricket or, or playing baseball or playing, uh, doing a recreation. My only recreation, because I have very little time, is reading Shakespeare sonnets in a scouse accent, which can be very rewarding. Do you um, still do different things rather than just announce? I do, yes. yes. So I'm a journalist of sorts. I say of sorts because I don't do as much as I should be doing, or as much as I did before I joined HTV, because it's a very tight schedule. Um, I'm a film reviewer, I'm a correspondent, and uh, I sleep a lot. <laughs> I mean, there must be very um, awkward the hours you work on HTV mm. sometimes. Yeah, very awkward, especially that. Uh, you see, the thing is, because of the, the, the setup over there in, in HTV, the hours are you, you are working in the leisure trade. There's a lot of there's a lot of bull attached to being in television. It's not a glamorous job at all. Certainly, when you see a, um, a drama or a variety show, it is glamorous to a certain degree. But I think you two are wise enough to know that behind the tinsel, if you like, behind the makeup, mm -hmm. there's a lot of graft. There's a lot of sweaty armpits. There's a lot yeah. of dirty shirts chucked in laundry baskets. There's a lot of nitty gritties, and. Fine, it is our job to not ever let that 
please God we don't, let us go forward to the viewing or the listening yeah. public. Uh, you might come off the air and say, God, what a hairy one that was, God. Uh, ooh, can you burn these underpants, please? But <laughs> uh, at the same time, you smile and you, you yeah. must do that. Not because you're conning the public. I think if you, if you start to smile and con them, then you're in trouble with yourself. And that mm -hmm. is the most dangerous thing to be in because then you're lying to the public. Mm -hmm. And they will spot it so quickly without knowing they've spotted it. And there's the danger. I'd say, mm -hmm. something like that guy is just not on. He, he's, he's phony or he's, he's having us on. He's conning yeah. us or whatever. Yeah. Um, no, it is difficult, but the hours are, it's the leisure trade. Let's be very frank about it. It is working the same as people in hotels work, people in um, theatres, restaurants, cinemas, you name it. Even people who work in hospital. Okay, you can't call it the leisure trade, but it is the same sort of thing. It's the sort of thing that we need when we are not doing our normal job. In other words, mm. nine to five people rely upon mm. the theatre, the, the cinema, the television, other divertissement, mm. uh, hoopla stalls, bingo, bingo. They rely upon that for their... Right. It's up to us to provide it, and it does demand a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of attention, and I think, and I please God I belong in it, a lot of professionalism no matter how flippant it might appear to be. Although I don't want it to appear flippant, certainly whimsical, but flippancy can be very disastrous. To go on to a, a lighter note now, this is something I'm sure our, a lot of our listeners will want to know. Do you really have a lot of trouble with the clock? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do, because... Well, yes, I do and I don't. I, I'll answer the question... In okay. a, in a, uh, I'll answer the question honestly. That it, I must admit that the gimmick, as it is now, is undeniably a gimmick, Started off when I did one night, I just got it wrong. I just couldn't see the clock. Uh, it just didn't mean a thing. There's a blank. Um, sometimes you see it, it's the old blind spot. It's G.K. Chesterton's Invisible Man. I didn't, it was there, but I didn't see it. And I just couldn't read it. So rather than saying, I, you know, I started this waffle business and whistle a tune, <laughs> which I thought, that's the end of it. My contract is going to be up with HTV. I've had it. But OK, I've gone out with a bloody bang. On the contrary, I got the clock right the following night, and there was a storm, and I mean that very sincerely, folks, a storm of letters saying, don't, for goodness sake, get the clock right again, because you've made us fall off our stools. So, th th I, I, all right, I went on to it for a bit. And I don't believe that... Put, I, I, I don't like necessarily the clinical idea of saying that time is exactly 27 minutes and 30 seconds past 12. I'd much rather say, and give the people at home who really need to set their watches or their alarm clocks more time than I'm fooling around. If yeah. they, and many of them must do, so that bloody fool's on again, <laughs> but they've enough time, <laughs> they've enough time to really look at the clock if they necessarily, they desperately want that clock to work for them in the morning. So, yeah. so well, he's, they, they shut me off perhaps, I might even yeah. put the sound down. Okay, yeah. good luck to them. But I, I think I've got one thing in my favour is that I give them more exposure of the clock than all your terribly far back precise yeah. time tellers. And um, basically, but of course, who wants to know the real time at that time of night? Your yeah. Fort West headlines, you hear you're reading them every evening. Um, how long do you spend on revision of this? Well, I don't revise them at all because I'm not in HTV. I'm not a journalist. I'm merely a mouthpiece for those pieces. They are phoned through to a stenographer who writes them down, type, types them from the newsroom and takes them down per se. In other words, they're put together by um, a journalist in their thing. So I'm a journalist elsewhere, yeah. but not there. I'm simply a mouthpiece. The only thing I have to say is, let us say, I get them very, very quickly before the time you see them. I have no time to revise them. All I can do is rehearse them, read them, and time them. That's all I'm there to do on this occasion. But obviously, if I see a glaring grammatical or factual error that I do know, let's, for example, say that somebody in 1947 um, sent a V1 over to London. Well, I know in 47, there'll never be one, one. So I'd say, well, sorry, it must have been 43 or 44. Uh, that is, it's the, only the obvious I can correct. I have no revision facility. I'm mm -hmm. not that sort of journalist in television, mm -hmm. although I, I, in other aspects of television I work, because it's the, it's all compartmentalised in television. You do your job under your own aegis, and that, that's it. You don't do bleed into other mm -hmm. departments, even though you can do. You might be quite proficient to do so, so it's a long way of answering your question, but it does answer a lot of other questions about why, for example, don't you produce programmes for HTV, or why don't you do this, that yeah. and the other. It, it is so tight because mainly union problems and also uh, guild problems and what have you. Okay. Could you, um, if you wanted to, perhaps become a reporter for Report West? Say? No, I couldn't oh. be because uh, 
One, I don't think they would stand me as a reporter, because I, I'm afraid that I would be too... I must confess this. I think I would find some of the banal stories, not just HTV, but any television station. Some of the last stories about Mr. Fred Smith has got a budgerigar that can recite the whole of Omar Khayyam in Urdu. Well, that to me would be whimsical and delightful as a report in itself. But to have to go and talk to this uh, comparatively inarticulate man and his budget at the same time, I'm afraid I'd just send it up. I would appear to send it up, although I've done in-depth reporting for some major television programs. Yes. Uh, have you ever thought about working for um, another vi television areas? Um, well, I have done for a long network. time. I mean, I, I've been in the game for about 20 or 21, 22 years. I've worked for ITN, ATV, Granada, Yorkshire, BBC Television, BBC Radio. Um, yes, I have thought about it. Mm. But now I've come to... This sounds like a, a plug for the West Country, but I'm in the West Country for many reasons. Um, obviously, as you know, I'm recently married. Mm. But that was not that was not the prime cause of my staying in the West Country, because I've had enough of the big city. I've had enough of London. If I go to London now on jobs, I look at my watch desperately to get the first train back. I want to know people, I've got umpteen friends in town who will invite me to dinner and what have you and have a freak out. I want the first train back to, to Bristol and my missus, or Bristol, before I met my missus, back to Bristol, because I want to be out of that. Because I'm getting old, I'm 27 now, as you know. We asked you that because of your colleague, Mike Prince, you must have a hectic life working for ATV as well at the same well, time. Well, it's not really all that hectic because he's on the motorway and it's an hour and a half backwards and forwards. And of course, he doesn't, well, he doesn't do the amount of work that I do um, because he owns a shop. So therefore, it is, he's a dilettante in a certain way that he can move around and do things. So he does, say, two days at ATV, a day or two at HTV, and then run his business thereafter. I'm getting a cue from the, my floor manager. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much.